So today I want to talk about something that's dear to my heart, and that is, in short, and it might sound cliche, fear and faith in trying times. Fear. I never thought I knew, actually, I'm not sure if I ever knew what fear is till COVID. Um, you have these phobias, you have these scares, you have moments of terror, but this constant living in fear, what's next? When's the next shoe gonna drop? Will that person recover, etc.? And I can't claim that I'm the one living in the most fear. There's people I know that are living in much more fear than I am. People literally living in terror, people who are maybe more prone to fear naturally, who are so immobilized by fear. And the problem with fear is, obviously, it immobilizes us, it, it makes us stop moving, it takes out our energy, and whatever energy we do have, we're wasting or we're using on what could be, what will be paranoia, just living in absolute anxiety. And we're paying a cost for it. Earlier today, I gave a shear to a bunch of teachers and we were talking about making sure that our children and grandchildren and students don't feed off our fear. You see, for the first time in our lives, we and the children are as clueless about the future. Usually the things that scare your child are things that you've been through or you've been through with your other children or you've seen it done. So you could guide your kid and say, don't worry, my boy, don't worry, my daughter, everything's going to be okay. This is what's going to happen. But in COVID, we're all walking blind. We're the blind leading the blind. And the problem is that our children don't know that. And all they see us and our grandchildren is we're as afraid of them. So interesting, the teachers were telling me that they find that the kids are actually much less fearful than the parents. The kids are the ones that are adjusting to it quite much better. And it's lovely to hear, and I see it in my own kids as well, but I'm still very worried about the long-term effects, I guess I'm afraid, of the long-term effects, what this year plus is doing to our children and how they see this world. I hope they don't see this world as a scary place. I hope they don't see this world as a... Um, totalitarian place, a place where you have no freedom, where you cannot be yourself. I really hope that it does not affect them. But this year is not really about kids, it's about adults. And our role, as, first of all, as parents, teachers, grandparents, etc., but simply as Jews and a people of faith, to be able to walk with less fear, not knowing what's going to happen is what being human is all about. Let's be honest. It's not as if we ever knew what's going to happen. We had a higher chance of predictability. In other words, yes, there were always the crazy stuff that happened out of the blue, but pretty much you could plan your year and 80% of it might play out. We're gonna go on holiday here and we're gonna develop our career in this way and our kids are gonna to go to the school we used to have some semblance of control, but the truth is we never did. Hashem runs this world. And not knowing what the future holds does not mean I cannot be at peace now. And I'm talking to myself, let me be honest. The struggle of being serene I, I, I sent a, a message to many community members of poor Shabbos, a Shabbos of serenity, because that's really what, you know, what I'm craving is serenity, to be serene, to be at peace, to be calm and embracing the moment. It's a huge challenge in our time. But unfortunately, too many of us are living in fear. And I wanted to take a sitter I'm looking if I have a sitter in front of me right now, an art scroll. Um, but 
in every spirit. At the end of each prayer, each davening, there is a few lines that's in the Chabad Siddur, and I believe it's in the Art School Siddur as well. After the Elena, it is, in page 160. And over there it says, on page 160, if you have a Siddur, you can check it later, some congregations recite the following after Elena. I would strongly encourage that in this time of COVID to take the word some out and we should all say it. It's just three lines, and I'm going to read it in Hebrew and in English. Do not fear the sudden scares and terrors or the destruction of the wicked when it comes. Let them plan a conspiracy against the Jews and it will be annulled. Let them speak your peace, but let them say their peace, and it shall not stand, for God is with the Jewish people. And God says, even when you age, I remain unchanged. And even to your ripe old age, I will be there. I created you. I will bear you. I will carry you. I shall endure, but I'm a late and I'll rescue you. That's the whole prayer. And each day after davening, I say it three times a day after Shachris Mincha Mayrev, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying it even more times. I say this prayer, and I encourage you to, to, to learn this prayer in English or Hebrew. It's three lines. There's even a kid song. Altira mi pitam. The point is, it is a message that we have to remember. al tira, do not fear. It's something that throughout history, we've always said these words to ourselves. That's why it's at the end of Davani, because it's something we always have to remember. al tira, do not be afraid. There was always something to be afraid of, sometimes more than others. But we cannot live in this fear, guys. We cannot live in this anxiety. Altira, don't be afraid. There's in, in the Siddur, in the Arts Group, on page 624, I don't know why I'm getting all Siddhari and quoting today, but there's a song that most people never see. It's the kind of pages in the Siddur that most people never see. But halfway through the page on 624, there's a song that people have accustomed to seeing on Saturday night. And the song, I'm not going to go the whole song, it basically is a bunch of verses about Jacob, because Jacob is the Jewish people, we're all the descendants of Jacob. So he finds a, 22 verses with the name Yaakov, all of them, he finished, he takes just three words of the verse and the letters of the Aleph, Betza, Aleph, Amar Hashem, Bachar Hashem, Aleph, Bet. He basically Hashem said to Jacob, Hashem chose Jacob, that's not the point. The point is, each line, after he uses the words Jacob and he finds a verse that's one of the alphabet, he finishes with the words, Altira Abdi Yaakov, do not be afraid, Abdi Yaakov, my servant Yaakov. So, for example, there's a, there's a melody, and you know I like singing, so I'm going to sing just a small part of it. Amar Hashem le'yakov al-tido, avdi yakov al-tido, avdi yakov, bochad Hashem be'yakov al-tido, avdi yakov al-tido, avdi yakov. Go al Hashem es yakov, and then there's a fast part to the melody. The point is, it's over and over and over on all the letters of alphabet again and again and again. Al Tira Abdi Yaakov, do not be afraid. My servant Yaakov. And the reason we say this is because upon Motzah Shabbos, it's Saturday night. We're, we just finished the Shabbat. We're going into a new week. And we're afraid. We're nervous. 
I'm not sure. Comes down and says, Al Tira Abdi Yaakov. Don't be afraid, my servant Yaakov. Don't fear. This is a song that's been in the Siddur for years, generations. There are many, many melodies to this word. But over and over, what have we been telling ourselves over the generations? Al Tira, don't be afraid. After davening, as I said, we say the words, Al Tira, don't be afraid. Why? Because we're finishing shul. We're going into the real world. Al Tira, don't be afraid. We finish Shabbat. We're going into the week. Al Tira, don't be afraid. You're leaving the cocoon. Al Tira, don't be afraid. Do not fear. And it's something that, as you see, it's in the Siddur. It's things that, it's been here for thousands of years, hundreds of years. It's this message that we have to remember. Do not live in fear. Not knowing what's going to be does not mean we live in fear. I was reading an incredible book this um, Shabbos. Some of you might have read it or met the author. The book is actually called Incredible, and it's written by the founder or the CEO, rather, of Arachim International, Yossi Vallis. And it's his life story and his father's life story and his ancestor's life story. If you haven't read it, I, I recommend you get it somewhere. It's an art scroll publication, just a mind blowing story. And one of the parts of the story that really resonated with me is his father's story, how his father survived six years under the Nazi regime. All six years he was in camps and his incredible ingenuity. And then once the war is over, his ingenuity of how to get to Palestine without, um, without, a, without a ticket. He comes onto the boat, sneaks onto the boat to be with his wife. Just incredible stories. And the one message that was coming across throughout the book, and I, I had to finish it in one sitting, so pretty much that was my whole Shabbos. Lack of fear. Stop, stop being so afraid. We faced tough times before. We, we have ingenuity. We have the ability of, 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 of defying the odds. And we have a father. We have a father in heaven. One of the things that Jews always knew is the reason they're never afraid is I have a father in heaven. Famous story I've shared, with, I've shared it before that Lubavitcher Rebbe's father-in-law who passed away 70 years ago, this is a long time ago. He was arrested just in 1929, sorry, 1927 by the Soviets for spreading Judaism. At that time, the Soviet Russian regime did not allow outward religion and the, you know, teaching religion. So they arrested him. There was a whole outcry international and miraculously he was saved and eventually made it out. Then he had to survive. The, he managed to get out of Germany out of the Nazi onslaught a few years later and eventually made it to the United States. But during his imprisonment, at some stage they're interrogating him in this, in this dark cellar in Leningrad in the uh, Russia. And he's not cooperating. He writes this himself. He actually wrote a diary of his imprisonment. It's one of the books my father published years ago was a book called Prince in Prison. And that's the diary of the previous Chabad Rebbe describing his actual story. So it's first person account. And he says at some stage, the interrogator takes a, a revolver, takes a gun and starts twisting and playing with it. And he says, you know, this gun gets even the bravest people to talk. And basically he was threatening the Rebbe. And Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak is sitting in this dark cell. God knows what his future will hold. 
truth is he was actually sentenced to death and only later on did they remove that penalty and eventually release him. But that's not what he's thinking about. He looks directly at this interrogator, a Jew, by the way, and says, this gun can only scare somebody who has one world and many gods. But I have two worlds, this world and the world to come, and one God, and that doesn't scare me. In other words, if all there is is me here and now in this pleasurable moment, then yeah, I have what to be afraid, but I have a bigger picture. There's a world to come, but even more than that, there's a God. How could you, how could you scare me? How could you scare me? And in this book I read on Shabbos, I read a story which in ways is even more incredible than the story I just told you. This Yassin Bala says a story about his grandfather, his mother's father, who was in the camps. And he made it all the way to the last day of the war, of, the, of when his camp was about to be released by the Russians, I believe. And the last moment, just before the Nazis leave, they say, we're going to have one more test before we go. One test. And they turn to this guy who was the rabbi, this Yossi's grandfather. And the Nazi has a piece of non-kosher meat, a piece of pork in his plate. And he says, eat it or I'll kill you. What would you do? What would I do? You're minutes away. The Nazi was about to walk out of the door. What have you decided? The guy looks at him and says, I won't eat it. The Nazi shoots, shoots him dead on the spot. 30 years later, his grandson is standing in a restaurant in Israel about to buy a piece, a non-kosher restaurant about, about to buy a piece of pork. And he remembers the story he, hears about his, he heard about his grandfather. And at that moment, he walks out of the store and decides to become religious. And he writes the whole story, how, it's, how it played out eventually. The last day of the war. The reason I'm sharing the stories is because sometimes I feel, although, you know, who are we to compare one time with another time? There's no question we're living in challenging times. So for some of us more than for others. And what's needed is to uncover within ourselves a deep bravery, a deep courage, a, a reservoir of faith that maybe we don't, didn't have to access so much in previous years. But now it's, it's, it's the call of the hour. We cannot live in fear anymore. We cannot live in anxiety. We cannot feel like the world is out of our control because as Jews, we know what we've been through and we know the miracle of survival and we know that things will turn out. Okay. It's going to be painful in the process. It's, very, it's already been very painful. But the moment we stop thinking big and we get lost in this moment and we get full of fear, we've lost. The great Rabbi Aaron of Karlin was a great Hasidic master. He used to say the, that the, there is no sin to be sad not a sin to be sad. But where sadness could take you, 
No other sin can take you that low. Again, sadness is not a sin, but where sadness can take you, no other sin can take you that low. Fear can break us and make us how do I say this? Bring out a part of us which is some which is a part we don't want to see, a part we don't want to live, a part we don't want to access. Fear brings out paranoia. Fear brings out blaming. Fear brings out self-pity. Fear brings out illness. We can't live in fear. First of all, because it's unhealthy, but mostly because, you know, what does it mean to be a person of faith? If believing in Hashem does not offer us comfort in the time of COVID, then what exactly is belief of God in our life? What does it actually mean? When you're telling your children, I believe in God, and that's why I go to shul, and that's why I fast on Yom Kippur, and that's why I, I, I only eat kosher meat, whatever your standards are. And then the kid sees you freaking out over this time. Then, then what does faith of Hashem even mean? I'm talking to myself again, I'm not preaching. If, you know, there's a, a, a statement in the Megillah, in, the, in, the, in the, the Purim story, that's in less than a month's time. Purim is going to be in three weeks from this Thursday. Unbelievable. And then comes Pesach. There's a line where at some stage Esther is hesitant, Queen Esther is hesitant, whether to go forth and try to save the Jewish people, go to the king and try to beseech on their behalf. And Mordechai tells her, Who knows if it's only for this moment, for this single moment, that you ended up as the queen. Maybe everything you've been through in life, all the tragedies and the surprises of life were there for one moment. And this is your moment. Are you going to lose it? Friends, maybe this is the moment that we've been nurturing faith in ourselves for decades. Maybe this is the test of our time. Our grandparents and great-grandparents, they had incredible tests of their time, but we're not living then. We're living now. And the challenge of our time is to not become cynical, to not become despondent, to not become afraid, to not feel sorry for ourselves, to be joyous, to find inner peace, to show the people around us that we are not allowing the circumstances around us to define our mood and our perspective of life. You know, a, a personal anecdote. After my father died, I started becoming partially, I'm sure it came across in the Shiram as well, a bit more dark in my world perspective. You know, th once death bites you so hard, it kind of taints your view. And I remember it was about six months ago, it was my birthday, and I was having a birthday for bringing, and a bunch of my friends were on it. It was a very meaningful evening. And at some stage, I remember one of my friends turning to me and saying, Levy, just because you see the world this way doesn't mean that that's the way the world is. We, we, you know, we, we have empathy for what you've been through, but your perspective is not necessarily reality. It's just your perspective. And it hit me. It hit me well. It was the right thing to hear. That's what good friends are for. They give it to you where it hurts. 
um, with love. You know, each of us in our own circumstances of life get tainted. And after a year of COVID, there's no question that we are seeing reality different the way we saw reality a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Can we afford to? Can we afford that our whole perspective of life gets shifted? Yes, we were living in a relative paradise, not all of us. Some of us had sorrows before this. But we never lived through such a crazy time in our lives. We have been through tragedy, but not this year of absolute madness. Freedoms taken away, opportunities taken away, setting your own schedules impossible, living in a somewhat dictatorship reality, not only in this country, but all over the world. We're pretty much freedoms have been taken away one after another for good reason. We never lived in this time. We lived in democracies, we lived in freedom. Even those who lived through apartheid, they, they didn't live through apartheid, they lived through freedom, mostly. And now we're tasting this, it's new. And we've been through it for 12 months already and it's starting to taint us. And fear is becoming a way of seeing the world. What next? You know, the insurrection in the United States, the demonstrations in Russia, now Myanmar's democracy is going to the dogs. And God knows, well, I don't know if you follow the news, maybe I should stop following it. But like, you look at the world, I'm like, what? What's going on? Like, what, what? I'll tear up, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If I could just recommend when you, you finish this year to open a Siddur on page 160 and open that prayer. I think there's no better time than, than present to start saying it every day. Shukar to everybody and thank you so much for joining.